In this tutorial series, we're learning how to build a cob house from the foundation all the way through the reciprocal living roof. And so far in this series, we've covered how to build a rubble trench foundation, an earthen floor, how to make a cob mix, how to build cob walls, and how to make and apply clay plasters. In this final episode of the series, we'll be learning about building a reciprocal living roof, which is a beautiful and functional roof system in which all the rafters are supported by one another, requiring no center support to hold the load. Beyond being aesthetically pleasing, green living roofs also provide natural insulation, which helps to regulate the temperature inside of the home. In the previous episodes, we explained the process of embedding roof tees into the cob walls, which provide a structural tie into the wall system for our bond beam at the top of the wall. Once the cob walls were complete and the roof tees were fully embedded, we came back and installed our bond beam using sections of 2x6s along the entire top of the wall system. At the intersection of each of the roof tees, we anchor two boards into the roof tees with structural screws. This system provides strength at the top of the wall and also allows us to have a structural tie into the wall system when we mount our rafters by screwing them into the bond beam. Here is what the cob house looked like with the bond beam fully installed. Before we began construction of the actual roof, we went over some basic explanation of the reciprocal roof design by using a small model made from wooden dowels. In this model, the small dowel with the legs attached that props up the rest of the rafters during their assembly is referred to as a charlie stick. The charlie stick supports the weight of all of the rafters during the construction process and can be removed once the final rafter is placed on top of the first rafter. There are two factors that influence the roof pitch, which are the thickness of your rafters and a measurement referred to as the rummy. The rummy is the distance measured where two poles meet each other, measured horizontally, and the shorter the rummy is, the steeper the pitch of the roof will be. We also demonstrated the installation of secondary rafters, which lie on top of the original primary rafters and provide extra structural support for our sheathing. As a final demonstration with the model, Josh sat on top of the dowels to prove how strong this roof system truly is. We then brought this demonstration to full scale by using our actual pine rafters and assembling them in the same way. This would give us the opportunity to make sure that the rafters all fit together properly and we could also remove any knots in the wood that were problematic. You can see here that the first rafter is held by the charlie stick and all of the following rafters are supported by the previous rafter. Once everyone lifts up, we're able to slide in the final rafter so that it completes the circle, and once we let go, all of the rafters are supporting one another without the need of the charlie stick. We also assembled the rest of our secondary rafters during this demonstration, and here is what the reciprocal roof looked like once the rafters were all assembled. There's a very useful Excel sheet on Daniel Seatman's website that allows you to calculate the diameter of the skylight opening and the roof pitch based on your rummy length, the diameter of your rafters, and the number of rafters you plan to use. After the demonstration, we brought all the rafters over to the building site and we set up the actual charlie stick to prepare for the construction of the roof the following day. After calculating the diameter of your central opening, you can divide it in two to find the radius, which tells you how far away your charlie stick needs to be placed from your center pole. With our charlie stick in place, we were now ready to start positioning our rafters for installation. We positioned the first primary rafter on top of our charlie stick and then lined it up so that it would lie on our spray painted mark on top of our bond beam. We then checked our measurements for our distance from our center pole to make sure it was properly aligned and we pre-drilled our hole so that we could attach the next rafter to this one. For this build we used pine rafters with approximately 6 inches in diameter at the base and 12 feet in length. Based on our calculations for our pitch and our skylight opening, we found that the bolt should go through the supporting rafter underneath at a measurement of 45 centimeters from the tip of the rafter. That then intersects with the rafter on top at a measurement of 10 centimeters from the tip of that rafter. 
We then bore out a hole to allow for the threaded rods and bolts to be installed flush with the edge of the rafter. We can then hammer in our threaded rod and loosely install bolts on both ends. Once the rafters were placed, we check our measurements to our center pole again, and then we keep repeating this process for all of the following rafters. So here we are again, drilling at the 10 centimeter mark on the top rafter, which intersects with our 45 centimeter mark on the supporting rafter underneath. We again bore the holes on the top and the bottom of the rafters, and then we install our threaded rod and bolts. In previous episodes, we explained how we designed the building in a way so that the primary rafters don't lie over top of any large door or window openings. This is important because we want the load of the roof to be supported by the strongest parts of our wall. When we were ready to install the final rafter, we worked as a team to lift all the other rafters slightly and we slid the last one into place. Once we made some fine adjustments and everyone let go, the roof was now entirely supporting itself without the charlie stick. We then finished installing our threaded rod and bolts before going back for one final check and checking the spacing at the end of our rafters. We found that they should be spaced 87 inches apart. And once everything was in place, we could go back and tighten all of the bolts and remove our charlie stick. With all of our primary rafters in place, we went around and secured the rafters to the bond beam with structural screws as we prepared to start installing our secondary rafters. We installed two secondary rafters on top of each of the primary rafters to give more support for the sheathing boards, and we spaced each of the secondary rafters 27 inches apart and attached them in a similar way by using threaded rod and bolts. Here we are installing the second secondary rafter for this portion of the roof. With our primary rafter and two secondary rafters in place, we begin to see a flat plane forming for this section of the roof. Our goal is to make this plane as flat as possible, so to do so, we go back and shim up the secondary rafters until they're at the same level as the primary rafters. Now that our primary rafter and secondary rafters are all in the same plane, we must go back and address this gap by creating shims. To do so, we measure the length and the change in height, and then we cut a shim out of a piece of scrap board. We then screw the shims in place and come back with a saw to make any fine adjustments. Once all of the shims are installed for this section, we now have a flat triangular plane that's ready to receive sheathing boards. We continue on with this process until all of the secondaries are installed and all of the primary rafters receive shims. For this build, we purposefully left the rafters a little long to be able to come back and cut them to length once they were installed. We measure our 2.5 foot roof overhang from the wall, and we install a length of 2x4 at the edge of the roof, which will allow us to come back and attach a fascia board to the edge. It's important to build cob homes with a large roof overhang to ensure that the walls stay dry during heavy storms, and here you can see the completed roof with the fascia board attached. Once our purlins are installed, we're now ready to install our sheathing boards. We chose to use 1x8 pine boards for the sheathing for this roof, which we sourced locally, and to install them, we used a piece of scrap 2x4 as a scribe to mark the angle that the wood needed to be cut to. Once the angle was cut to fit, we used screws to attach the sheathing boards to the primary rafters, and we come back and nail the sheathing to the secondary rafters. We chose to install multiple sheathing boards at once, and we left them long to be able to come back with a chalk line and snap a line that would then give us a clean finished cut. We then separated into teams and continued installing the sheathing boards all the way up the roof until the sheathing boards were all installed.
The following day, we used large sections of scrap wood to create step downs and bridge the gap between the sections of the roof. The waterproof membrane we would be using on this build was somewhat fragile, so in order to get rid of any sharp edges, after the step down boards were installed, we came back and attached a layer of cardboard on top of all the step down boards. In the meantime, we went around and trimmed all the rafters flush to the purlin boards. We also began attaching our fascia boards using the same 1x8 pine boards that we used as sheathing on the roof. Once the cardboard was all attached, we then used some scrap lengths of carpet to cover the roof, which would create added protection for our waterproof membrane and also add some insulation. Once the construction of the roof is complete, you then want to install a waterproof membrane. And for this build, the clients chose to use a 6mm plastic membrane for affordability purposes, but a common alternative is to use an EPDM pond liner, which is recyclable, durable, and has a lesser environmental impact. We placed gardening cloth filled with gravel at the edge of the roof to improve the drainage and then installed downspouts using PVC pipe and flashing tape. As we continued building the living roof, we also went back and closed the gap in the roof with more cob at the top of the wall. Once the waterproof membrane was installed, we then began building up the layers of our living roof, starting with a few inches of sand as the base layer. We start at the edge of the roof and we work our way towards the top, allowing the sand to build up off of itself. And once the sand layer was complete, we begin building our second layer up using straw. We apply the straw in a similar way, working our way from the edge towards the center of the roof. And lastly, we add a layer of local clay soil that we collected during the excavation process for this build. Now that the layers of the green living roof have all been installed, we only had a few things left to do to finish this build. The last few things we needed to do to finish this build were to apply clay plaster at the top edge of the cob wall, to install a skylight in the central opening of the roof, and to apply our final finish layer on our earthen floor. We mixed more clay plasters using the same ratios from the plastering portion of the build, which you can learn more about in the how to make clay plaster episode of the series. We again dampened the cob wall and applied the plaster with trowels until we achieved a smooth finish along the top of the wall. We explained the process of creating an earthen floor in previous episodes, and with our base layer complete, we were now ready to pour our final finish layer for our earthen floor. We moistened the base layer with water and then applied a mixture of one part clay soil, two and a half parts coarse sand, one and a half parts masonry sand, and half a part of manure. Be sure to check out our How to Pour an Earthen Floor episode to learn more about the process and to learn how to create your own earthen floor mixture by creating test samples. To create the skylight, we first cut the rough shape out of some scrap wood and then constructed a frame to support our glass from underneath. Once the frame was installed, we carefully cut through our waterproof membrane on the roof and then sealed everything off with flashing tape. We placed another frame on top of the waterproof membrane and a third frame to connect the first two frames. For our glass window, we used the top of a glass table that we found locally, and then lastly, we attached a frame to keep the glass secure using 2x4s. To officially bring this build to a close, we installed our front door, and here is what the final finished cob house looked like when it was complete. I'd like to thank Claudine Desiree, the owner of Cruising Cobb Global, for allowing me to attend this workshop and create this video series. Cruising Cobb Global offers cob workshops globally and is one of the only organizations where you can build an entire cob cottage in five weeks. This experience was truly life-changing for me and I would highly recommend attending a workshop if you're interested in gaining hands-on experience building with cob. 
Also, thank you to all my new friends that I connected with throughout this workshop. This series and this build wouldn't have been possible without each of you. If you enjoyed the series, be sure to like and subscribe, and also follow us on Instagram to keep up with our latest projects and offerings.